good afternoon and good evening. My name is James Schofield and you're listening to My Growth Coaching, a podcast which explores the field of business coaching. In each episode of this series, I'm talking to expert coaches from inside and outside of the international technology company Siemens about the business coaching issues they encounter with their coaching clients and how they work together to find practical solutions, helping each client become the best version of themselves. My guests will share interesting case studies about the challenges people face in their business life and how they deal with them. It could be dealing with conflicts in a team, overcoming procrastination, taking difficult decisions, balancing family and career, all issues that we are familiar with but which maybe we don't know how to solve on our own. So join us and make sure you listen to the very end because that's where I'll give a short summary of the recommendations from each episode that might help you manage your life just a little bit better. In today's episode, I want to look at coaching for women who are trying to balance having a career with bringing up a family. And to do that, I've invited a friend of mine who I met in Siemens quite some time ago now, Ulrika Dovi. And I have to say what I really remember about Ulrika from those early days was her incredible energy. In particular, she never wanted to wait for the lift to take her from one floor to the other in the building that we were working in. Uh, She seemed to think it was too slow, so she'd run up and down the stairs to her next appointment. Now I don't know if she still does that, but it really wouldn't surprise me. Um, Here's something about her background. She studied economics in Cologne and Salamanca and later got a PhD in software engineering at SAP. She's been driving the topic of AI inside Siemens for six years now, most recently for Siemens Financial Services with a team which includes um, seven different nationalities. Gender equality is a matter which is very close to her heart, which is why she founded the Female Data Science Network to promote and support female data scientists. And she does a lot to support women in tech. She's married to another Siemensiana. They have two children and live in Munich. But now let's get down to our interview. First off, I wanted to know what had brought Ulrika into coaching alongside her regular job in AI. Tell us a little bit about your coaching background. I got um, education in systemic business coaching by the HR Academy in Munich a little bit over four years ago. And Mm -hmm. during that training, we did lots of it on site, but also already virtual. And that gave me the confidence that coaching in the virtual setting works just as nicely as it does in a a one-on-one setting. But what drew you to coaching in the first place? Why did you decide this was something you wanted to do? I mean, you had a career in Siemens. You didn't need to go into coaching. What what led you to there? I got to enjoy a professional business coaching myself. I had three sessions with a wonderfully experienced and right on spot business coach that gave me insights and let me see things from a totally different perspective and really helped me advance significantly. And that's why I, when I thought, hey, this is a skill I would love to develop myself to help other people get ahead in that way, self-develop in that way. Um, all right. So you, I know, have, have got quite a lot of experience in coaching women who want to develop their career, uh, but they also have families that they're taking care of. So what are the kind of issues that these clients bring to a coaching session? So many times when women return to work after, for example, parental leave, they return in part time. And then they have the feeling that they do as much work as their colleagues who are full time, but they don't get the same recognition. They don't get the same remuneration. They don't get the same trainings offered. They feel they don't get the same chances to develop their career. 
That's one reason of frustration for them. Other reasons may be that they feel left out in a way that some colleagues have passed them, are advancing their career much faster than they are. Yet another reason may be that they expect to be picked, to be found when there is a career opportunity, when there's a new position opening up. And they forget that they may need to advertise what they are capable of doing. So you mean that they, they, they sit there waiting to be asked and they should be maybe putting up their hand? Exactly. Then a typical right. thing that happens a lot to women, not only, but majorly maybe to women, is that they forget about networking in the sense that uh -huh. it helps you develop your career and help develop personally. And many times women do networking and mean getting together with other women or colleagues, chatting, having a good time, knowing them by name, knowing where they work. And they don't focus on how could somebody help me advance? Who should I talk to to get a next um, level or an, uh, take a next step? And, and do you feel this is something that men do more automatically than women? I, In my experience, it's many men that learn that from early on in their career. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Okay. I mean, I think it's very interesting the point you make about um, women who are, who are also um, uh, looking after their families are so working part time, um, how they often feel that they that information in a team in a department passes them by. Um, and uh, I'm sure you have some examples. One example I remember was a team where I was doing um, a, a workshop about uh, we were doing a workshop together about the um cooperation in the team so w how the team was working together and uh there was uh, one woman there um and the rest were men and the men were convinced that yes that everybody shared information mm. uh, and it happened that i was looking at the single woman at that point mm. and and um i i saw her making a face Mm -hmm. So I asked her directly and I said, so you don't feel this way, uh, Christine, um, uh, what's what's the issue here? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, th for her, the trouble was it wasn't that people were not sharing information. It's just that they forgot to share information. <laughs> So she she would she um uh she would leave at maybe uh one o'clock in the afternoon to go home and uh and uh pick up the children from from the kindergarten or whatever, um and then inform uh, and then things that happened in the uh in the afternoon were not passed on to her. It wasn't deliberate. It was just that nobody had thought of it. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine that you, you've encountered similar situations. Yeah, very, very good point. Exactly that happens. You know, when somebody is part-time and leaves early, like you say, or they take off each Monday, each Friday, right. and whatever happens on those days, of course, is lost on them. And it yeah. takes, I must say, it takes deliberate effort on uh, behalf of the others to uh, record whatever they were sharing mm. or to transport mm -hmm. that to that part-time colleague. Right. Yeah. Yeah. True. And it's in my experience, it's not normally malicious. It's not not people trying to keep somebody yeah. down. It's just they don't think of it. Exactly. Also yeah. happens with time zone differences, by the way. Really? Yeah. I happen to be leading a team with an American colleague who mm -hmm. can only participate after two, three o'clock in the afternoon. So any meeting mm -hmm. that happens before is either recorded and we expect her to watch it. Or mm. is lost on her. Right. So also with timing of meetings, you have to be very cautious when you just have a um, very globally spread team. A lot of clients, uh, a lot of your your women clients have these kind of issues. Um, how do you support them? How do you help them? What do you what, what's your approach? So we're speaking of coaching, and coaching is help for self help, right? So what I try to do is. Let them see their situation from a different perspective. Take on somebody else's um, view or get into their shoes and um, open up their own perspectives. And then that sometimes opens up a world of other possibilities and steps to take. So what sort of question might you ask? I might ask in this and that situation, 
what do you think your manager's interest is? What uh -huh. does she okay. or he want to uh, get at? Or right. when this is about a difficult situation with a colleague, I ask, well, what do you think he admires about you? Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's about, it's, um, it's a competing situations. Mm -hmm. And when competition arises and is so transparent, it may sometimes have to do with somebody being envious of what mm -hmm. you get, what you have, where you are part of. So also think of that. And then always think of what is in it for them. If you want to convince them to cooperate with you, well, why would they? What is their benefit? Maybe okay. you can give them visibility. Maybe you can let them decide. Many times it's just about giving the other person the impression that they have a say in what's happening mm -hmm. and that they are part of this and not just receiver of information, but also designer of what's happening. Okay. I mean, sometimes um, uh, I've had the experience in my, in my coaching sessions that the coachee um, tends to blame everything on the other person. He's mean. Uh, he doesn't respect me. She uh, is only interested in her own career. It's not me. It's them. Uh, have you experienced this? And, and how do you work on that? Yeah, very good topic. Yeah, that happens a lot. And then there are two things. One, I tell them, you can only change yourself. No way on mm -hmm. earth you're going to change the other person. Even if they were the meanest, we're not, or you're not <laughs> going to change them. So you better get to grips with how they behave. And then there's also, if this is a person they have to work with, you know, over an extended period of time, you may have heard about this value quadrant or square. Yeah. Where you try to see what is the value that is driving me in this um, uh, unhappy situation, I want to say, and what's the value that's driving them. Because at the heart of it, we're all value driven. And like you say, nobody is mean by nature. They may just have different priorities than us. They may just go after different goals than us. So it's really mm -hmm. helpful to find out what is it that's driving them and then see maybe they're exaggerating this a little bit. That's why I didn't see it in the first place. So then I give them the benefit of the doubt. And also my behavior with them may be driven by a value, but exaggerated. And then mm -hmm. I can develop into you know, taking that a little down, doing a little bit less and reaching that mm -hmm. normal level of things. That's one thing that helps mm -hmm. a lot. And then there's, um, you've probably heard about this, the devil's circle. That's a very German expression. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is the same in English. Yeah. Vicious circle, I think. Ah, you're so right. Thanks so much. So my behavior triggers somebody else's behavior. And then their behavior in mm -hmm. turn triggers mine. So that's the circle that we seem to not be able to get out of. Well, once mm -hmm. I've gotten to see their perspective, I can see mm -hmm. how a little change in my behavior may lead them to change their behavior as well. The one tricky right. thing with, with that is that happens a lot in partnerships also, not only at work. But right. you think of yourself with your partner, with your child, you know, that one topic that always gets you both to fight. And if you then put yourself into their shoes and see why could they be so irritated every time this happens, and then you yeah. take a slight change in your behavior. And at first, that will probably simply irritate them because they won't believe it that you have changed because they've seen you a hundred times do it that way. Yeah. So yeah. now the hundred and first time you're doing it differently. Eh. So that's where you have to be pertinacious. And keep showing your new behavior a second time and a third time. And right. after a little while, they will see, ah, okay, she's gotten it. She has, uh -huh. I don't know, agreed to putting on her house, her slippers at home, whatever it is. And then right. the other person may change their behavior as well. And that's how you can get out of that vicious circle. Okay. Okay. So basically, um, you, you adjust your behavior and this has a knock-on effect on the behavior of the other party. Exactly. And that works both in, at home and in the office. Yeah, it sure does. Okay. That's, by the way, the, what the systemic means in systemic coaches, coaching. You yeah. think of, you're not by yourself in the world, but you interact mm -hmm. with others. And everything you do and say has a little or large effect on how everybody else looks at you and behaves around you. And the slightest yeah. change that you do in that system will 
inevitably lead to a change in the others as well. It may be tiny, maybe large, may take you a while to realize, but it does have a change effect. All right, yes. The uh, the butterfly wing in the Amazon causing a storm in, in Northern Europe. Exactly, exactly. So in, in your experience, are there uh, are these t- are the topics that male clients bring to your coaching sessions are they the same or are they are they very different? Um, some are similar and some are different. So let me think of mm-hmm. the topics that male clients had. Well, sometimes they were managers of teams and they had to decide how to split a team and how to mm-hmm. tell people that they were not going to be part of the new team. So this was in kind of sacking somebody, firing somebody. Right. Or telling somebody that they just weren't performing well. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. the other way around, how do you get somebody to perform? Mm-hmm. And that's what we had discussed a few minutes ago. You cannot change the other person. You can change yourself. You can change your own perspectives on things. And you can, of mm-hmm. course, lay out for the other person why it is um, appealing for them to do something more or to do something differently. But in the, in the heart right. of it, the other person has to change themselves. Yeah. So that your topics yeah. that male colleagues had. And okay. then also development. What should be my next career step? Here I am. Yeah. I feel like I'm dominating or I'm fully in charge of what I do. And I would like to take an, on a new challenge. Which direction should I yeah. take? Should I go for look for a different um, unit within Siemens, the Siemens Cosmos? Should I look for an entirely different position? Should I try yeah. and go abroad? What could be my next step? Right, right. Okay, okay. So, uh, and you're saying that, that male clients tend to bring these more career-oriented uh, topics to, to sessions? In my perspective, yes. But of course, I've had, I don't know, um, not hundreds of male clients, mm. maybe rather tens of them. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about, I mean, I'm also interested, you know, as I get older, I'm interested in the in the difference of topics that... Um, uh, younger clients bring as it goes as opposed to older clients do you find that there's a difference between the topics that younger women bringing bring to coaching sessions compared to older women or um, not really uh, yeah there is but i wouldn't say that is um, women specific i think that goes mm-hmm. for all of them when we're younger mm-hmm. of course we're thinking about more which direction should we give our career mm-hmm. Um, Mm -hmm, could mm -hmm. be more fundamental, could be, you know, with a longer lasting effect. While Mm -hmm. older colleagues, they are not as, I don't know, ready for significant changes anymore. So they're looking to have their work situation more agreeable. Yeah. Maybe that is for both. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting cases I ever had uh, with a with a, a, a woman client was uh, when she was thirty five, um, had been super successful uh, mm-hmm. in everything that she'd done from school, university, career, uh, super duper, and everything. Uh, and then suddenly at thirty five, she suddenly turned around and said, "Well, what's it all for?" Mm-hmm. Uh, and I find that that thirty that that mm-hmm. age thirty five mm-hmm. seems to be in a time when a lot of people start reflecting on what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can totally um, second to that. I had a client, well, she was a bit younger, in the 20s, and she was deciding whether she should leave to get a master's or whether she would take on a new role or if she wanted mm. to um, go abroad. And right. um, that was her, yeah, it was a pretty decisive moment, I want say, would say. And in the end, she, we did uh, some coaching, you know, around the alternatives and what was most appealing to her right, uh, intuitively. And uh, in the end, she and then convinced herself to go abroad with the company. Uh-huh. She got right. a, okay. a job possibility within the Siemens Cosmos, but abroad. And that was wow. what she wanted. Okay. And an older colleague, um, um, yeah, trying to be politically correct here, <laughs> but yeah. let's say towards the last quarter of her professional career, she yeah. decided that she wanted to learn something. And she just needed mm-hmm. help how to get herself to learn that new technologies, in that case it was, in uh-huh. a structured way. And okay. how to okay. lose fears and how to lose self-doubts. And then she really mastered it and to the point that she was then 
even coaching others or helping others wow. to master that technology. Mm. That was really wonderful to see. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I do. Uh, uh, perhaps it's the same for you. It is hugely satisfying when you feel that you have helped somebody to um, uh, to to find the best way forward for themselves. Do you do you get that satisfaction from coaching? Oh yeah, I do. I totally do. And on the other hand, I am also frustrated when I see that they don't find the way that they're looking <laughs> for. You know, when we have the second or the third, third session, and I have the feeling that they haven't moved much from their right, right, yeah. thinking even. So many times yeah. it's mostly about how you perceive life. You know, maybe yeah. it's not, not about changing dramatically, but looking yeah. at things differently that lets you yeah. relax or that lets you see um, the be the beauty in the situation that you have. Maybe right. that's alone a help helper. And when that yeah. doesn't happen at all, that gets me frustrated as well. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. What about you? I mean, uh, what's your experience of balancing um, the demands of family and career? I mean, uh, you are married to a, a, another Siemensiana who's also uh, quite busy in Siemens. Um, and uh, you have uh, have really um, uh, gone a long way in the in the Siemens cosmos. But you also have, I think, two children, is it? Two yep. children, three yep. children? Two. Um, and uh, and you also, I know you've been uh, quite active in in local politics. Um, how do you manage? How do you manage to juggle all these balls? <laughs> I ask that myself every evening. <laughs> um, and mm. actually, I must admit that many times the kids are the ones who get least time from me. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. luckily, they have a voice and they can pull me, and then. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen that same day, but then we spend some time Friday evening or the week uh, end ahead. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I, I have to admit, sometimes I have very short nights because right. during the day it's work, then evening is family time, then maybe I want right. to see friends and go to, I don't know, a musical event or something like that. And then it's back at the laptop at yeah. 11. And that's not um, wow. the best choice. It just happens sometimes. <laughs> okay. But actually, there's one thing, maybe that's interesting for people. You can find out what gives you energy. If you think about mm -hmm. it, is it a specific person? Is it a specific place? Is mm -hmm. it a specific um, thing you do? Is it having a massage mm -hmm. or something? And just realizing what it is helps a lot. Knowing that there is some, you know, energy spender, uh, uh, sorry, energy mm -hmm. delivery for me. And then putting that mm -hmm. on your calendar. That alone can help okay. a lot. And, and in your case, what is it? <laughs> Sometimes it's going to the mountains or many times it is. And if that's too time demanding, um, it's a run. So, I mean, obviously here in Bavaria, you're ideally situated. You have mountains and lots of space to run around in them. So true, true. A good, a, a, a good solution for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, coming today to talk about balancing uh, family and career and I, I hope that other people have found it. So let's just summarize today's episode. The theme was managing family and career with a focus this time on women returning to the workplace after having children. The key issues Ulrika and I identified that clients found themselves facing were 1. Recognition. If they return to work part-time, they often find themselves doing as much work as their full-time colleagues, but not getting the recognition, the remuneration or opportunities for training that full-time colleagues do uh, and which can help them develop their career. The result is that they are often passed over for promotion possibilities. Secondly, there were often information gaps. Women working part-time often miss out on important information within the team simply because they aren't there at the same time as their male colleagues. Third, uh, conflict situations, uh, which can be both open and hidden. And here are the recommendations. Uh, one key is definitely better networking. 
women tend to view networking as being about getting together for purely social reasons, but they need to see it as an opportunity to connect with people that can help them develop their career. And in Ulrika's experience, this is something that men tend to do from uh, quite an early age. To deal with information gaps, it's a job for the whole team to ensure that information is shared equally. However, this won't necessarily happen automatically. So if women feel that they are affected by information gaps, they need to highlight this as an issue within the team and also make practical suggestions for how to deal with it. Conflict situations, um, conflicts often have a dynamic called a vicious circle. And what happens here in a vicious circle is that people find themselves locked in a spiral which is never changing, it goes on and on. What can help to break a vicious circle is if one of the parties is willing to try a change in perspective. So if you can identify what the other person's needs are, you have a much better chance of dealing with the situation. Of course, you cannot change another person but by adjusting your own behavior, you can influence them. And finally, uh, an important point that Ulrika made was that balancing career and family can be exhausting. And she recommends two things you can do to help you manage it. Firstly, make sure you consciously build in time for your children, which is purely for them. Uh, and secondly, make sure you schedule time for an activity that will help recharge you, whatever it is. It might be going swimming, it might be having a massage, it might be hiking, it might just be taking a bath, but just putting it into your diary will help you cope with all the other demands. That's all from this episode of My Growth Coaching. If you like this podcast, please follow and give it a rating on whichever platform you use. And tell your friends about it too, especially if you think some of the ideas I discussed with my guests could be useful for them as well. After all, sharing is caring. I'll be back interviewing more great coaches about their experiences soon, so keep your eyes and ears open. Until then, take care and goodbye.